here's my favorite thing to talk about. I know I'm a gastroenterologist and I should, should stick to talking about, you know, intestines and stool and so on, but this concept in the immune system is so important. And, you know, it, when I was in medical school 30 years ago, it just wasn't explained well, to be honest, immunology was very complicated. It was all those things you saw on the previous slide, right? It was the GPR 109A and IL-18 and neutrophil chemotaxis and GPR 41 and GPR 43. And it was complicated and it was not necessarily intuitive in terms of how it all worked. And so I love being able to present to you this very basic and simple model about how it works, a balanced immune system. So I want you to pay attention to that green balanced immune system, optimal effectiveness in the middle. And then on the left side are internal threats and on the right side are external threats. So what happens if you have an under reactive immune system? And there are two typical settings in which that could happen. One is a primary immune deficiency that you're born with, and that would be conditions like SCIDS, severe combined immune deficiency syndrome, where the babies are prone to all kinds of infections and have to live in a sort of st more sterile environment. And so or this, the more common would be secondary. That would be a drug. That would be you're taking a steroid or a biologic or some drug that suppresses your immune system, or you have HIV, human immunodeficiency virus that can cause also a secondary immune deficiency. And what happens there is that internal threats can lead to cancer. And what I mean by that is that when cells multiply, sometimes they multiply irregularly and the genetic material in the cell is a little off. And normally if your immune system is active, it's not doing surveillance just for pathogens. It's not just looking for SARS-CoV-2 and Ebola. It's also looking for those faulty cells, right? Those cells that have reproduced a little bit funnily and are off and they need to be destroyed because if they don't get destroyed by your body's internal immune surveillance system, they could turn into cancer. When you have an underactive immune system, that doesn't happen or it doesn't happen as robustly. And so you are at an increased risk for cancer you are also at an increased risk for viruses that have been dormant in your body. So for example, if you have chickenpox when you were a kid, you're now at risk for shingles because that virus can reactivate. Tuberculosis can reactivate. Varicella, which is a virus that causes chickenpox, can reactivate. HIV can become more active. Hepatitis can become more active. So, you know, with, with long COVID, which is what we're seeing is a prolonged state of activity or a reactivated state for some people. That's not new for us for viral infections. We see that with hepatitis, we see it with HIV, we see it with varicella, and we see it with bacterial infections like TB, as well as several others. We see it with mono, with Epstein-Barr virus. So we, we know that viruses can do this. And we know one of the things that will increase the likelihood of a virus reactivating or a bacterial infection for that matter is an underactive immune system, okay? So that's cancer and reactivation of dormant infections as internal threats. These are things that are going on in your body that your immune system should normally be able to fix, but when it's underactive, it can't fix it. And now you have these disease conditions. What about an underact underactive immune system and external threats. Well, those would be the infections in the first place. So viral infections, bacterial infections, fungal infections, mold, et cetera. If you have a suppressed immune system, whether because you were born with one, you got a virus that created one, or most commonly you're on medications, you're treating a disease with a medication, but that a side effect of that medication is that it suppresses your immune system, and that is now putting you at risk for other diseases. That's a problem. That's a problem with our modern medical paradigm. So let's say you were on a big dose of steroids for some inflammatory condition. Now you're at increased risk for COVID, for fungal infections, et cetera, for all these external threats. So that is immune under reactivity. What about an overreactive immune system? You know, I hear people talking about wanting to boost their immune system, and I see people selling supplements to boost your immune system. Well, boosting your immune system is not necessarily a good idea because boosting your immune system leads to autoimmune problems and allergic problems. And let me explain how that works. 
again, left side of the screen, internal. Th- I, I literally could talk about this slide for an hour. I just think it is so key to understand these concepts. So internal threat, what is an autoimmune disease? An autoimmune disease, remember I told you we have about 108 of them. They affect one in five Americans. If you don't have one, you probably know someone who does. People often have multiple. They'll have eczema plus psoriasis plus colitis, or they'll have MS plus rheumatoid arthritis sometimes. So why do they have multiple? Because it's the same root cause of microbial disruption for a lot of them. And again, not to overstate it, genetic predisposition plays a role. Environmental exposure plays a role for sure. And for some of them, for example, there is fascinating data that has just come out in the last few weeks about MS, multiple sclerosis, a disease that can be devastating being related to viral infection, EBV, the Epstein-Barr virus that's associated with mono, is now thought to be one of the main causes of MS. Not always, and not the only, but an important one. And we know that Epstein-Barr virus can also lead to a kind of lymphoma. So it can lead to cancer or autoimmune diseases. So to get back to autoimmune diseases, so we're talking about things like Hashimoto's, thyroiditis, rheumatoid arthritis, lupus, Crohn's, colitis, type 1 diabetes, etc. Your immune system is overreacting and it is reacting to your body's own normal tissue. In the case of Hashimoto's thyroiditis, it's reacting to your thyroid. In the case of colitis, it's reacting to your normal gut bacteria and your intestinal lining. In the case of rheumatoid arthritis, it's reacting to your own joints right? So it is, it is treating self as the enemy. There's self and non-self in the immune system. And it is mistakenly looking at self and calling it non-self and saying, Ooh, this is a problem. This is a pathogen. We need to react. In the case of external threats, it's allergic reaction. So it's, you know, severe peanut allergies, food sensitivities, allergies, eczema, uh, hay fever, things like that, just reacting to the pollen in the air. And I want you, let's even go back a couple slides. I want you to remember this. I want you to remember fiber, gut bacteria, fermentation, short chain fatty acids, healthy immune system, anti-inflammation, right? This is not an accident how this stuff happens. And it's not always your fault, but what I want to tell you is that most disease does not just fall from the sky in our laps and flatten us. We can follow those breadcrumbs backwards to figure out where this equation went wrong. Maybe it was the dose of steroids you were prescribed by the doctor. Maybe it was the massive amount of antibiotics you had as a kid that disrupted your microbiome or the standard American diet you've been eating. But what I am passionately about is helping people understand and find the root cause so that they can ideally reverse some of these processes. They're not always reversible, but many of them are. Okay, let's keep going. Let me, let's quick check of the time. Okay, we're doing fine. So I wanna tell you now about two or three of my favorite studies. This one, A Tale of Two Cities, is a study that was published several years ago. I first read about the study in the, in the Economist, actually, not in a medical journal, although it was in all the medical journals too, but it's a study by an Italian gastroenterolo- pediatric gastroenterologist named Paolo Leonetti from University of Florence. And he did a study looking at babies born in Florence, who are eating very much standard American diet, you know, pizza, ossobuco, gelato. So high fat, high animal protein, high sugar, low fiber. And he compared about 14 of those kids, those babies in Florence, Italy, with a cohort in Bullpon, Burkina Faso. Now in Bullpon, Burkina Faso, people still live like their Neolithic ancestors did. They are primarily gatherers still, and they farm subsistence farming. So the diets could not have been more different. The kids in Florence, again, now very important to know that both groups of kids were vaginally born and breastfed. And what he found is as infants, the microbiomes were virtually identical. 
But as soon as the babies migrated or sort of graduated to table food and were eating their local diet, everything changed. So what were the babies, the toddlers in Florence eating? They were eating high fat, high animal protein, high sugar, low fiber. What were the babies, the toddlers in Burkina Faso and Bupon eating? They were eating a plant-based diet. They were eating grains like sorghum and millet that they would, they would sort of grind it on a stone into a thick porridge that they would eat with vegetables and with herbs. And that was their staple. In the rainy season, they ate some termites as a form of animal protein. And on special occasions, one of the chickens running around the village would find its way into someone's pot. But it was by far a diet of unprocessed whole grains and vet root vegetables, vegetables and herbs. And what did they find? This uh, study was published as the impact of diet and shaping gut microbiota. And again, European children consuming a Western diet, they had a greater abundance of gram positive bacteria. Well, we'll talk about what that means. The African children eating the high fiber vegetarian diet, they had a greater abundance of bacteroidetes, higher microbial richness, so more microbes in general, more species diversity, very important marker of a healthy microbiome, lower prevalence of pathogenic strains, and the most important thing here, they had high levels of short-chain fatty acids. In fact, they had double the levels of short-chain fatty acids compared to the European children. So what's really interesting too is that the Italian children had bacteria growing in their microbiome once they were eating the, you know, again, the Western diet that are associated with diarrheal disease, that are associated with obesity. The African kids had bacteria associated with leanness and low levels of inflammation, and again, double the short-chain fatty acids. But what I want you to realize is that neither group of kid were sick. We're talking about completely healthy toddlers. But what we are seeing is we are seeing the foundations for disease being laid down early based on the diet. So as early as when they first started eating table food, we start to see the microbiomes changing and going in these two different directions. One of which, now let's be clear, the African children, they have to worry about malnutrition. They have to worry about tuberculosis and malaria. So, you know, it's not a bed of roses for them, but what they don't have to worry about is autoimmune diseases and dying from COVID and having obesity and diabetes and hypertension and stroke and heart disease and all the rest. That's what's in store for the Italian children based on the way they were eating. Okay. Uh, somebody just said, I don't know about European children, but most American toddlers have already had a dose of antibiotics by the time they're toddlers. And that that is actually correct. In fact, most American children have had 18 courses of antibiotics by the time they graduate from high school. But let's get back to these two nutrition studies. So that was a study from Italy, Paolo Leonetti, African kids, lots of fiber, high short chain fatty acids, lots of good bacteria, European kids, lots of fat and animal protein, low levels of short chain fatty acids, bacteria associated with obesity and diarrhea and inflammation. Okay. Now, you might say to me, well, Dr. Chotkam, that is really interesting, but what if it's not the food? What if it's the environment? The people in uh, Bopon, Burkina Faso are eating like they're, it's the Mossi tribe, the Mossi ethnic tribe. And they're not just eating like their Neolithic ancestors. They are living like their Neolithic ancestors. They're living in Adobe huts. Let's see if we can go back. Um, so we'll see. Oh, I don't have a picture of one of the huts, but they're living in these, in these, um, you know, in these huts surrounded by animals. They have dirt floors. So they're living in close contact with lots of soil microbes. Maybe that was a reason that they had this healthier microbiome. So here's a study. It's one of my favorite studies. It's done several years ago now, published in the journal Nature in 2014. And this study showed that diet rapidly and reproducibly alters the human gut microbiome. And why I love this study is that we all know that if you eat differently, your microbiome will look different. But did you know how quickly that happens? So in this study, this is a study done by Harvard researchers in Boston. They took nine volunteers and they put them first 
on basically an Atkins diet on, you know, what's pictured on the left side of the plate. So it was prosciutto and pork rinds and eggs and beef. And I believe it was pork rinds for snack on that diet. They put him on that diet. I'm getting heartburn just thinking about that, but they put him on that diet for five days and they looked at the microbiome before, during, and after. And then they rested those same volunteers and they did not change her environment. And a week or two later, they put him on a plant-based diet, nothing crazy, jasmine rice, lentils, tomatoes, but mango and banana for snack instead of pork rinds. And they looked at the microbiome before, during, and after. And what they saw microbially, the biggest change was a decrease in what they call the bilophilia, the bile loving bacteria. And bilophilia are important and necessary for breaking down fat that's an animal protein. So we know that if you go from eating a high animal protein diet to a low animal protein diet, the bilophilia will drop. But what was fascinating and unexpected was that the genes changed also. So the bacteria change within about 30 hours of the food hitting the gut, which means that right now it's Friday about noon EST. By Sunday, you can have a different microbiome. It's amazing, right? I mean, remember genes, you get what you get and you don't get upset, but even your genes will change because what they found in this study is that with a dramatic shift in microbes due to the dramatic shift in diet, there was also a dramatic shift in the genes that were turned on and off, which means that you could be born with a set of genes that predispose you to something and based on how you eat and changing how you eat and incorporating large amounts of fiber, even if you don't become vegan, you don't have to be vegan, but if you increase, significantly increase the amount of plant fiber you're eating, you can prevent that disease from being expressed. And to me, that is the most optimistic, fantastic news that I have ever heard in my entire medical career. And it's not just news, it's fact, it's science. 